So greetings, and welcome to today's educational program, uh, Discovering Profound Insights into Operational Excellence by Dr. Gregory Watson. This is your moderator, Doug Wood, with the ASQ's Quality Management Division. So today we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Dr. Gregory H. Watson. Please join me in welcoming him. Dr. Watson has degrees in Management Law and Industrial Engineering. He's an 18-year ASQ Fellow and past chair for 2000. He received the ASQ Distinguished Service Medal plus the Lancaster, Crosby, and Ishikawa Medals. He's been named an honorary member by 17 national quality associations. Dr. Watson delivered speeches to more than 20 ASQ national and divisional conferences, twice for the Quality Management Division. He's a former quality executive with Hewlett Packard, Compact Computer, and Xerox, and he has coached executives in a number of organizations, such as Nokia Mobile Phones, Toshiba, ExxonMobil, and, and 20 other companies. He's also the only Westerner to be awarded a Deming Medal by the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, the W. Edwards Deming Award for Dissemination of promo and Promotion Overseas. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Watson. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doug. Well, tonight we're going to talk about OPEX, or Operational Excellence, in its long form. And, and the, the idea as we're going to talk about here or where does this actually come from and so the, the very beginning what I want to do is set the context for operational excellence or OPEX thinking and, and when we think about this idea of, of pursuit of excellence which is the title of that 1980 book by Tom Peters and Bob Waterman the challenge is you know what is this meaning of excellence it seems like it's kind of a relative thing like quality and how does it shift with the levels of managerial responsibility in organizations. Now, is excellence the same at the operational level as it is the executive level? And so what we see is that at the very basics, what we mean by excellence is it's a quality of extreme value or exceptional merit. It's not everyday. It's not ordinary in any sense. And so it's something unusual. And we can talk about organizational excellence, which is for everything that the organization does. And here we're talking about the sustainability of the organization, its ability to last a long time. And so organizational excellence is the delivery of long-term business and operational excellence. It's a combination of the two. And when we think of business excellence, we're thinking about the consistency of performance results. And so business excellence is delivering predictable stability in the key performance outcomes. And we usually think of these as financial outcomes or productivity of units produced. And when we talk about operational excellence, we're talking about the persistence of process performance so that the work that's being done in the organization is actually consistently delivered and so it's producing excellent results. And so the, the Y as a function of X equation is working well. And so we look at this organizational excellence. It has these, both these two components, business excellence, and, and that's short circuit now for what we tend to think of as things like the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award criteria, and then operational excellence, where we tend to think of such things as Lean or Six Sigma. Now, if we look at this whole organization and the way we manage, I've broken this, this into a, a planning system or a strategy management system. And it's three layers in an organization. And we see that this base level, I'm calling it Gemba 1, the gray boxes at the bottom, that's the operational function of the organization. And, and, and what we see here is that the operational excellent component is the daily management system. And it is also changes that happen to it that come down from strategic projects. So the daily management system is where the value is produced. Now, the level above that is the cross-functional and the executive level. And this is where business excellence occurs. And we see that the strategy management process here is taking an assessment, the strategy assessment, of what happened in that daily management system. It's getting guidance from the governance function, which is again the three above it. That's like the board of directors or the ownership level of the organization. It's then searching for strategies, and then it's trying to figure out how do we deal with the threats and, and vulnerabilities and improve those opportunities that we have. And we do that with change, uh, strategic change projects. And so those strategic change projects change the daily management system. 
And so this is the business excellence function at the, at the middle level. The organizational excellence is where we add both of those with the governance function. And the governance function is, is what we think of as the role of the board of directors, perhaps. And, and their job is to review the business, uh, provide resources to the organization from, from investments or uh, joint ventures or other decisions about uh, the, the ownership of the, the, uh, the whole enterprise. And, and they also establish purpose. Why is this organization here? They set up the, the high-level business assumptions as well as the strategic intent for what it will do in the future in a very broad brush way. So as we look at these and we start saying we're going to design an organization for excellence, we see all three of those functions have to be working together in some sort of cooperative system. Now, if we seek excellence in this three Gemba system, what we see is that this Gemba three organizational excellence is the governance functional activity. And that is how do we structure the organization's ownership and, and how it operates in the external world, particularly the worlds of finance, uh, legal structures, and so forth. Gemba two is about business excellence. And this is about the commercial management activity of the organization. And GABA 1 is operational excellence. This is the daily management activity. What does it take to do our job on a daily basis, do it consistently, and get a stably excellent outcome? And that's what the focus of this webinar will be on. What's actually happening in this GABA 1 or this operational excellence uh, structure? Now we're going to take uh, one of my favorite quotations. If you've been with me on the, this, uh, this series of seminars, you've seen this a couple of times before. And we're going to sort of take a scientific perspective to studying quality. And so Matsubasha was a, a Japanese haiku poet uh, from the 1600s. He only lived to be 50 years old, but that was an old long time back then. So I look at 72 now as my age, and I think oh, he's just a young guy. <laughs> and, but he said, do not seek to follow in the footsteps of the old masters. In other words, don't do exactly what they did. Instead, seek what those masters sought. So what we see is, is we have many masters that have been walking the quality corridors before us. And it says, don't necessarily do the same things they did, but try to understand what were they trying to accomplish for the organization? How were they trying to drive excellence? And, and what was it that they were doing? Don't use your tools. Your tools may no longer be relevant. I gave a lecture on that this morning uh, for the uh, Quality 4.0 Summit that, that's happening now uh, virtually. So what we need to do is we really need to understand what do we mean by this operational excellence term and, and how does it come about. Now, many of you know the Toyota production system. And when we think about this, we, we think this has been around for a long time. You know, we had Womack and Jones book come out in 1993, I guess, the, the machine that changed the world. Then 95, I think it was, that Lean Thinking came out. And so there's a lot of things. And, and what we start seeing is if we think about Toyota, many of us think we really understand what it is. And, and the trouble is that when we start looking at it, we see things like pull, we see things like JIT, or we have flow, Kanban ideas, Hijunka. Jadoka, Andon, Gemba Walks, Muda, uh, Jeshuiken. And, and so all of those are, are different tool components that go into the Toyota production system, but they're not the Toyota production system. And, and methods and tools don't really describe how that system actually works. And, and so when we think about it, we've seen diagrams like the House of Quality, where we see there's some sort of standardized work. There's a pillar for just in time. There's another pillar for Jadoka. And, and we have then this Toyota production system underneath it. Is that how it really works? Or is there some sort of glue that holds all of those components together as an integrated system for delivering operational excellence? So just having the labels doesn't tell us what to do. So it's a nice picture, but it's not very informative as a systems diagram. So it's only scratching the surface of what the Toyota way really is. Now, Taiichi Yono was a designer of much of that Toyota system. And, and just as much as, as we can start saying that, that the Toyota family it also was part of the designers of that system. And we see that, that when we take a look at what Taiichi Yono had to say, we see that we have to understand and learn about this in the context of 
what was that overall system? And he says, to be understand means to be able to do. So it's not just you can think about it, but you can actually execute something. He says, knowledge is something that you buy with money. Wisdom is something you acquire by doing. So wisdom means you understand what you're doing and you can project it further into the future. And we get that by our experience. He says, visualize what you do and then manage the flow. Visualize means we can see it and we can understand it and we see what's happening differently. That's what allows us to manage the flow. And he says, let the flow manage processes and not let management manage the flow. Well, what does that mean? Well, the flow is happening through the work processes and, and they actually dictate by the time it takes, the amount of work assigned to the them and how the, the processes have been balanced, they decide how the flow can go. When we're saying management manage the flow, that means management interrupts the flow by saying, let's start this work now, do that faster and so forth. And we do not then honor the natural flow that we have beat into that work by the way the work was designed. And he said, the key to the Toyota way, what Toyota makes Toyota stand out is not any individual elements, it's not the tools, it's not all these Japanese worlds, words, but what is important is having all the elements together as a system. It must be practiced every day in a very consistent manner, not in spurts. And often I hear people talking about, we're gonna have a Kaizen activity or we have to have so many Kaizen activities a month. Toyota never has Kaizen activities. I think this is interesting. I'm having a long-term conversation with one of the designers of the Toyota Fremont plant, He's a, his man's name is Kimura, uh, he's in this battery management system. I'll talk a little bit more about him later. But he, he has said, you know, Toyota never does activity. This is a symbol of naive Toyota production system. And what we have to do is realize Toyota's Kaizen is something that happens every day, one step at a time, and it's in all of the, uh, the ingredients. And, and what we call Kaizen activities they would call it a Kaizen Conway project that a supervisor pulls together. So it's a very different type of thing that's happening. So do we really understand the Toyota production system? Well, I'd ask a different question. Do we really know what the Toyota management system is? In 2017, um, actually, let me go back one step before this. I, I don't have a slide here, but I should. Uh, in 2015, um, the International Academy for Quality in Elected Sorichito Toyota as an honorary counselor. It's the highest uh, recommended position you can have in the academy. And he accepted, and, and we, we got a chance to meet him in Tokyo back then in September. And, and I spent a couple of days with him. And, and in the conversations, I asked him, don't you care about the fact that so many people are saying that they're doing the Toyota production system and it's not what you do? And his answer was quite interesting. He says, no, we make cars. In other words, we're not a consulting firm. We don't train other people. You know, all the people who've written about this uh, are economists or teachers or uh, educators, and they're not actually people who do the, pro, pro, the Toyota production system. And so they don't really understand it. So they take a view of this, and then they come out and they say, like the six blind men looking at an elephant, I believe it's this, I believe it's that. So they don't see it as a system. And, and so then I asked them a second question, I said, don't you care then that people say that the Toyota production system does not work because it's failed so many places? And then he got upset. And, and he said, no, I do care about that because this is something that matters. I will fix this. And his fix was to actually take an, a group there called the Toyota Engineering Corporation and make it public. Two years later, or a year and a half later actually, I met Toshio Horikiri, who's the founding president of that Toyota engineering company. And at the fifth production system summit in Sochi, Russia, he gave the first public lecture on the Toyota management system. And the Toyota management system is much more extensive than the Toyota production system. So the Toyota production system is one third. It's fed by the Toyota design system, which is where they create the cars that go into the production process. And that is fed by the Toyota sales system, where they take the cars, sell them, and capture the voice of the customer. And it, it, it's a reinforcing, a self-reinforcing circle that brings all of those together. And if we take a look at this, what we start seeing is in that management system, there's two systems objectives. 
So one is about quality assurance and the other is about cost assurance. And that the quality assurance, its goal is waste reduction. The cost assurance goal is cost reduction. And what they do is, is they only manage in the process cycle time as a performance measure. And the reason for that is that cycle time is a proxy for both quality and cost. So in other words, if, if cycle time is increasing, that means there's waste in the system or there is too much cost, there, there, excuse me, there, there is, um, there will be too much cost in the system, but maybe there's a bad motivation, maybe there's a quality problem, uh, maybe there is a flow problem where people are having some sort of training issues, but no matter what it is, cycle time is the bell ringer. It says there's something wrong. And then as a result of that cycle time being off, target cost is off. And so we start seeing with time, if you factor the performance of that system the right way, you can actually manage the whole system with just the time-based measurement process. So when we start taking a look at, at Toyota, I believe the very best article that's ever been written in the West was written by Stephen Spear and Kent Bowen, decoding the DNA of the Toyota production system in 1999 by Harvard. And, and he said there's, there's four things that are, they call them the rules that govern this daily management system at Toyota. And the first is that all work shall be highly specified as to content, sequence, timing, and outcome. And that's talking about the daily management system. Every customer supplier connection must be direct. There must be an unambiguous yes or no way to send requests and receive responses. That's talking about clear communication channels. The pathway for every product and service must be simple and direct, and that's managing the flow of activities based on the pull of the demand. And any improvement must be made in accordance with the scientific method under the guidance of a teacher at the lowest possible level in the organization, and that's structured team problem solving. So when we look at this, we start seeing a fundamental principle of everything they do is the daily management system. And when we look at how they're managing OPEX, we start seeing that the Toyota prediction system has three different types of improvements. One is the Hoshin projects. These are the ones drafted by the management team outside of the factory and assigned to the factory as an action plan. So, so that action plan is, is basically what we start seeing. Uh, the, the factory is going to get resources to do, and they will be then changing the way they do their work. Then we see team-based projects, and team-based projects can be engineering functions coming in to change the factory, or it can be production system functions, changing the distribution of the way it work is done. And then we see individual improvements happening within the work cells or by the individual workers. And these are the Kaizen activities, always looking for a better way to do things. And Dr. Duran observed, he said, all improvement happens one project at a time and in no other way. And so these are the structures for how Toyota makes change happen in their system. And they're basically either team or corporate projects or they're individual projects which are my activities in my work, and I have a project for how I want to think about improving something. Now, when we look at how the daily management system works inside of Toyota, I have some surprises for you. So, so when we take a look at what is the daily management system, we see, first of all, that all commercial value is created in the daily management system. It's in Gemba 1. That's the value production engine of an organization. The the two engines are actually finding value, managing value, or capturing value. But value production is in Kemba 1. And we see that there are some, some observations. So work is movement. It's applying energy to achieve a purpose. Work can add value if it achieves a purpose, or it can create waste, loss, or inefficiency if it does not contribute to its purpose. And three types of work are conducted for organizations to achieve, maintain, sustainable, predictable work. So one is standard work. This is the routine work. This is what we, we, we think of in terms of standard work instructions. The other is continual improvements. These are either individual or team-based projects to make that standard work better. And then we see strategic work. These are the Hoshin projects. And these are achieving value to customers and satisfying workers. So the workers saying we are actually participating in the strategic change of our organization. Now, when we look at how this is structured, the Toyota production system is actually just the tip of the iceberg. And underneath it, there are two components that contribute to it. 
One is total quality management, and that's the defect reduction methods. And the other is total productive maintenance, which deals with availability and safety assurance. Uh, underneath that is the factory management system, which is the cost reduction methods. And we start taking a look, you know, we see the TBS, we all knew about that, but what are these other two layers and how do they operate in this daily management system? Uh, the last time I was at Toyota and we were driving over around N N uh, Nagoya, or what they call Toyota City in the center of Nagoya where the factories are, and I remember that, that uh, our Toyota guide pointed out these, these tall buildings. They said, you know, we just saw the visible factory. There's the invisible factory. We have 8,000 engineers working on the control mechanisms of the factory management system. And when people talk about the visual factory, that's all you need to know. No, it's not. What happens is there is a very big system underneath that that manages conveyor belts, manages flows, manages the control mechanisms. It has everything orchestrated and, and moving together. And the visual part, the simple machines that they have, yes, that's all part of Toyota. But there's also this other ingredients that go into it. And so if we look at this, we see the TPS is JIT, it's just in time, it's Kaizen, it's Jidoka, or making this human enterprise work, it's Hijunker, managing both material flow and also order flow. And it's based on uh, Siriyuka, which is the pull system. We see that TPM is about this, this concept of the uh, Hoshin, it's an Hinshitsu Kanri, and then that, that uh, I mean, it's TQM, and then the factory management system is using these visual controls, the 5S4R, probably never heard of the 4R. That's actually the, the, the way you build the daily management system, make rule, teach rule, keep rule, change rule. SMED, single minute exchange of dies. Gemba Ryoku, which is work capability, and on which are work controls and signaling systems. So those are all based in this whole process in both TPM and the factory management system. So what do we mean by this? Well, TQM is, is a process that, that's been uh, developed in Japan basically in the 1950s, 1960s. And, and uh, if you go to the website and you dig deep enough in the Toyota website, you'll see that they thank Shiro Mizuno and, uh, and, and uh, Takichi Atsaka as, as two quality gurus in Japan who taught them total quality methods. And so TQM is, is definitely a part of the Toyota system. And so you can have quality assurance, and that's talking about products. Quality control is controlling processes and then products. And total quality management is applying that control mechanism to the whole organizations as well as its product and problems. And it consists of a number of things. So it's like customer focus, continual improvement, PDCA, uh, quality circles, work standards, the quality toolkit, statistical analysis. All the methodologies are put into that. But what we've done is it's been expanded so it is operations excellence for everything that's being done in that organization. Total productive maintenance is looking at reducing cost of operations by how we maintain the physical assets and then giving responsibility for uh, the workers to maintain the uh, routine upkeep of that equipment. And, and so they work on eliminating losses due to performance, like minor stoppages or off-speed conditions, availability that comes from equipment breakdown or changeover, and then quality, which are the particular startup rejects that happen with the machine, or operational defects that come in as a function of the machinery. And so what they're doing is they're applying methods of source inspection, 3S, so it's a series C Don Sisu, and autonomous maintenance. They're also doing inspection management, visual control, condition monitoring, maintenance scheduling, and work order management. So all of this is focusing on equipment maintenance. Now, now you notice I said only three S's. So the fourth S, uh, which is Siketsu, is actually the long-term cleaning and lubrication, which happens on a different cycle. And the fifth X is, is Shitsuki, which is this sustainment or the discipline process, and that happens when you do 3S over time. So it's not a unique step in the process. It's an outcome from discipline and practicing 3S. So 3S is the foundation. Then we look at the factory management system. What we see there's there's many ingredients. These are all of the ingredients that are contained 
in the factory management system. So I won't read them all, but what's important is that the IT component, and, and we're talking today about this quality 4.0, but the IT component is production planning, production tracking, and production control. As we start taking a look at this, this is where the systems of the future are being built in. And, and so the controls for the quality, when they can be taken offloaded from the people. So welding is done by no longer humans, it's done by a welding machine, because why? They can do the weld right every time. People have too much variability. Painting systems are no longer done by people, they're done by robotic paint heads. Why? Because they also do a smoother job and you end up with a better paint service. So they start energizing their system, actually, by the use of automated technologies. And so this is all being built in. That factory management system is actually where they're doing most of the technology development for the future of those production systems. Now, just to give you some idea of what the invisible factory looks like, this is sort of a rough structure of how it's all controlled. So there's a, there's a basic strategic plan, production strength plan, they have design mechanisms, they have machine equipments, they have production systems, they have monitoring technical processes, and all of that goes into a computer based, and that's a computer monitor, uh, comp personal computer, and that can all be put together and linked with an AI system, which it is a Toyota. And so as we start taking a look at this, we should not be surprised. Toyota has a very big artificial intelligence component built into its production systems. So. Operational excellence, Toyota. What are the methods for daily control? This is what we talk about OPEX and daily control as being two of the critical components for how they're put together. And so we start seeing some of the things we start understanding. So I wanted to show you this. This is an overall schedule of what the day is. It's not the flow of the builds or the production. But what we see in here is that each machine has a board. So there's one board. There's a day, if you will. There's, there's a break time for lunch. There's a break in the afternoon. We see this little blue component. That is the break at the beginning of the day. So that is city seat time. That's the getting ready component. So we think of that as maybe a huddle, a meeting sometimes, but it's, it's not very long. It's very quick. And at the end of the day, it's the end of the shift 5S activity. That's really just CSU. And, and so we see that there's a color code for a week and there are different color codes that, that they can change for this. And then within that, they will schedule what the daily work plan is. And that's on a different board, that's a daily work board. And, and so we see each of those is, is a one way for taking a look at it. And then they manage this construction by saying, here's the multiple weeks. So as we're looking out, we can start saying, here's a blue week, here's a green week, here's an orange week, and here's a light green week. And we start saying, here's what we have to do with the different works. This comes from a, a uh, shop that's making the wire harness assemblies that go into the Toyota Corolla. And, and we start seeing that this board is combining visual codes, logical locations, and status of workloads in each of those different areas for the different machines that are being held there. It says what is actually being done or planned for each of those particular weeks in the month. And then they were scheduled into the daily board, and then there's another one that is actually saying what happens exactly in that day. And we also see that the andon signals are there. So andons are signals that communicate what's going on. And so we think of andons as, as basically sort of three, a normal running signal, a stop for a changeover or maybe require immediate help. And, and so they can also be a little bit more specific, stop for breakdown, stop for changeover or waiting materials. This is a planned stop and this is normal running. And, and we can also see that there can be some variety in this. So, so one button here is I require help, but I'm not stopping the line. And, and this is, I think, another important thing is that many times people think that the workers can stop the line. No, they can call for help. And they get then the, the uh, a person is called the water beetle, so the Mishawashi, or the supervisor will come. They will verify in the talk time that they have available is this something that we can correct or not? And then they have options. And so the car is moving, so they have maybe another five feet or so they can keep working on the car. And at that point in time, if it can't be done, they take the car off the line. 
they don't stop the line. So Toyota rarely will actually stop the production line unless there is an epidemic situation in terms of quality coming from the supply side. If it's a worker-related thing, the supervisor will take him off and, and train the worker so they can get the job right. And the water beetle, uh, this uh, Mizuwashi, will actually take over it and then do the job himself. And, and we start seeing that, that there's some caution that they have that, that signal that there's some things that need to be paying particular attention to. So, so the, the Andon light, it actually requires what they call imadesho. So imadesho says, now is the right time. Do this immediately. So these are signals that say, you can't wait. This is an emergency. Go take care of it. And there are three conditions that create that emergency case. So they call these the three H's. So that hajimete, which means it's a new product. First time we do it, we have to get it right. It's, it's usually going to be a problem. Uh, henko, that means there's a design change. That means there's an inflexible rule. We have to change something, and we have to take a look at it again. Hisase uh, bori means that it's infrequent production. It means actually, literally, long time no see, like to a friend. And, and so this is saying we have to have special attention in these three H conditions. And at the beginning of the day, the supervisor will set the tone at that very first meeting saying, we have a 3-H condition today. Now we have to be on our toes for this day for, because of that. Now, it's been said that eliminating waste is the basic fundamental of the Toyota production system. And, and we start seeing waste did not just get created because Toyota talked about it. Uh, in 1925, a man named Stuart Chase wrote a book, The Tyranny of Waste, and he focused on lags, leaks, and friction that occur because there's poor unity of control in a production system, and, and that these things are mismatched, leaks in material flows, uh, they, they led to production losses, and, and problems between organizations where there was friction, there was no collaboration. And, and he defined waste as any bar to maximum use of value of output at minimum real cost in energy and materials. And he said that coordination is how you eliminate waste. In other words, flow or wah, harmony. And, and he describes it in his first theory of waste this way. He says, there are two parts in this theory of waste. Analysis of requirements, the target which the econo economic activity aims to get, and the effectiveness of production methods with which these requirements are met. That sounds an awful lot like process capability to me. So requirements, upper lower spec limit, and then the process variation, six uh, standard deviations of the variance. So we start seeing he's thinking the same way. And he observed that waste is an engineering problem. It's not a moral or an ethical problem. And, and so he says, we have to understand it. Now, Shingo said the most dangerous kind of waste is the waste you do not recognize. And so one type of waste is mori waste, the unreasonable or irrational waste that creates loss. And we see there's a lot of conditions that create this mori waste. And so it's requirements that are impossible. It's leadership-induced waste because of bad decisions. It's attempting to push systems, people or machines, beyond their limits. And, and this can be built into management systems, like in standard costing, or purchase requirements with wrong rules, like always buy from low-cost country, or maybe things that we put into the design equipment where we have standard parts which actually are not capable of doing what we need in our design. So management often creates mortality by its use of average performance instead of properly treating variation in the system. Okay? I see this all the time when, when people say, you know, at the executive level, I don't really care about quality. I said, oh, so, so what do you want? To just be an average company? And the answer usually is, no, I don't want to be an average company. Why would you ever think that? Well, because that's what you will get if you don't think about quality. Because quality thinking is actually they say you want to be better than the best, and that's a concept of quality in it. That's what excellence is. So we also see mortar waste is uneven or inconsistent flow, which creates timing waste. And this is variation that's not caused by customers. And we can start seeing there's a number of things here. And, and we get rid of this by implementing the just-in-time management. And, and so when we start saying, look, what's actually creating these, these causes? Well, many of them we're doing to ourselves because of the way we produce things, the way we drive the orders through the system, and so forth. 
And then the last type of waste is motor wastes. And these wastes have to be redefined for us to understand because this is wasteful work that's not useful or productive. And this changes based on every company and what we're actually doing in that system. So any process activity that doesn't add benefits or generate waste. So there's two types of motor. Type one is non-value-adding work. And so that means we have to be uh, changing our business so we eliminate this. And the second is non-valuing tasks uh, that, that we can't really eliminate. And so we start seeing there's two types here. So the required work is type one, then the non-valuating work, which we can get rid of. And these are the, the seven wastes, if you will, that, that Toyota has, or the eight wastes if we include the waste of the human capability, which is the one that, that Teichiano added to the seven list. And, and the problem is that that doesn't work in most organizations. Toyota named those wastes in 1950 by a group of engineers and workers at the operating level of basically a mechanical engineering run factory. It was not a digital factory of today. It did not have the same concerns that we have about systematic environmental waste and so forth. And, and so we shouldn't use the same system that Toyota has. So I recommend that organizations actually do a waste audit and name your own waste. Now, what types of waste do you find in your organization? If you use these three categories, mori, mora, muda, and then we use the three levels of the organization, Gamba 1, 2, and 3, we can actually create a matrix. And then we can operationally define what are the wastes we see Gamba 1, 2, and 3 for each of those three types of waste. And once we identify things that are going wrong that are waste, we can then operationally define them. And then we have a second matrix that's going to follow this, where we can classify them and then have examples. So if we, we create this, this, this matrix here, we say, okay, we can have all of these wastes, Mori, Mora, Muda, Gamba 1, 2, or 3. So what do we do? Let's do an audit and find out what waste we have. And then once we capture those, then we can go to our second problem, list all the waste, say which category is it, Mori, Mora, Muda, and then what's the dominant level in the organization? Where is it happening? How big is it? And then what do we define that term operationally? So not the Morty term, but this waste specific that we see. So maybe I see that I'm having chemical leakage. So how do we define chemical leakage? And then can we give an example that people will recognize from our system so that we have it actually fully explained so we can understand exactly what we mean by that? So when we start talking about operational excellence, I think there's a couple of takeaway lessons here. And, and we start seeing that the, one of the observations is that the daily management system has to include all of its components. So the Toyota production system has three components in it. Toyota quality management, so the total quality management system has to be there. Total productive maintenance, so TQM is about the people in the system. TPM tends to be about the equipment in the system. The factory management system is about the information technology that knits that all together. So if we're going to have daily management, we have to have all of those operating holistically. And operational excellence delivers a stable yet continually improving system of daily management that can control its variation. So what we've seen in this webinar are, are, are sort of three things. We've discovered the Toyota management system. We've understood how that management system works. And we understood that one of the fundamentals that we have to do is to connect to what we mean by waste and loss in our management system. Now, some of you may be looking at the clock and saying, oh, Greg, it's just, you know, 18 more minutes to go. You're cutting us short a bit. Well, not really. Because remember the last time I talked to you, I talked about the Kano model. And at the end, I had this quiz. I said, there's 10 questions about the quality kids. How many of you actually took that quality quiz on the Quano, Quano model? I wish I could have a show of hands, but I can't really do that here. But what I want to do now is give you the answer, because it's been a few weeks, and, and maybe you've, you've had these things buzzing around in your head and saying, I don't really understand that. I wish I knew the answer. So what I'm going to do is, is quickly go through each of these, and then we have some time for questions. So under which of the three quality characters occurs, would you most likely find a killer app or a hot product? Well, there's more explanation, but let's just say that tends to be attractive quality. 
Question number two, do attractive quality and one-dimensional quality converge or do they diverge as they approach engineering excellence? So engineering excellence is the top right-hand quadrant and that's where the one-dimensional quality is going in one director. They converge actually at that point in time because what's happening is that there's very little physical difference in them and they're both are re uh, then getting the same amount or essentially equivalent amounts of uh, customer satisfaction. So it, it's more a matter of the numbers of, of competitors that we have and how fast they're actually getting to that level. Question number three, will attractive quality always be superior as a decision-making criteria, criteria to the other two functions? Well, intuitively it's appealing, but it's not always true. So, so if I have an attractive quality characteristic, but I have performing a, a, a one-dimensional characteristic that performs poorly, or I have a must-be quality characteristic that's bad, that undercuts anything about attractive quality. So it actually is not just a single characteristic we have to look at. We have to understand all of those characteristics of a product. And then how do they all work together? And are any of them actually degrading you? Uh, because remember, uh, there's a, an old saying that uh, uh, if if you have a, a person and you you don't want them to think about getting better, just starve them. So so that security need and the need for food that's a must be quality item that then immediately takes away their idea of democracy or wanting to vote. And so that, then that they just become thinking about how can I survive. Question number four: What quality function will customers most likely describe as being important? And, and what we see is this is this one-dimensional quality because this is where they actually have spoken quality and they start talking about what is it that the the customer uh, is looking for in a specification or request a proposal question number five which quality characteristics are most likely to be ignored when a voice of the customer is is survey is conduct, conducted well ignored quality is either one of two types these are the unspoken so customers don't know what needs to be uh, uh, attractive quality because they don't understand technology. That's the second one. But the first one is is in the, the must be quality. Customers assume they're going to get it anyhow because it's basically so tightly coupled to the name of the product, like the car that stops, starts, and steers. I don't specify that it has to do those things. But if it doesn't, I feel badly. Number six, do one-dimensional quality and must-be quality converge or do they diverge as they approach engineering failure? And, and what we see is that they converge. And, and the logic is actually just the opposite of the one-dimensional line and the attractive quality line. Because as, as these two get to the very poorly engineered uh, product, then this one-dimensional and the must-be quality are actually getting to be pretty much the same point, the zero satisfaction point, and, and poor engineering. Number seven, where does irrelevant uh, quality come from in the Kano model? Well, this is kind of one of those that's disappeared unless you saw his original paper. And, and irrelevant quality describes a characteristic, no matter how well you design it, it remains in the neutral zone. So it's basically, this is occurring because this characteristic it doesn't change no matter how much you get better. So, so basically, it's a, a line that's basically going through the zero point in the satisfaction curve, and it, it's roughly parallel uh, to the x-axis. So quality of design, then, in this case, is mostly ignored because the customers never experience it. They don't want it. Question number eight, what does an irrelevant quality, uh, what identifies an irrelevant quality? And, and again, it's par parallel to that fulfillment axis. Actually, I just sort of answered that question already. And, and it's actually probably there's a zone of indifference around the center. because maybe a couple of points up in customer satisfaction or a couple of points one way or the other in engineering. We don't care about any of that. It just isn't enough to excite us about what's going on. Number nine, what is reverse quality? Well, this is a situation where we're comparing, if you will, a plot of uh, over time. And, and, and what we see is, is if I take a time series plot of a particular function and I say, okay, we're not changing the design of this function. But if your competition does, 
your function can actually go down in customer satisfaction, even though you had not changed your engineering because the customer satisfaction judgment is relative to the competition or to the other offerings. And so we start seeing this, this uh, relative function happening because engineering changes, the customer satisfaction changes. We may not have changed anything, but our perceived customer satisfaction can actually go in reverse from what it was. And the final question was, how do these quality functions relate to design strategy? And here we see that, that new product development teams can start looking at features or functions of a product and using these three curves as a way to classify them. So it must be characteristics, must be in that product, and, and that they have to be high reliability because they can't fail. So they have to be flawless in a sense. And if it's one dimensional, then they have to be compared to who is the best competitor. Because if you want to win in the competitive market, you've got to be ahead of the competition for what the customer is looking for. If it's attractive quality, then this becomes a sales point. That means you can use this in advertising to sell your product and position it as better than the competition. And so this is actually motivating customers to want to purchase it. So, Doug, I think we've come to the end of, of the pizza candy. And um, I, I said last time why I call it pizza candy. And that's because you pay for the pizza, but on your way out, you'll get a little peppermint for free. At least that's the way it works here in Finland. So, Doug, are there any questions tonight? Yes, we've had a couple. Uh, so, uh, one of them uh, from from Sunkong talks about, and and I may not be stating this quite right. He says two questions: What and where does the analytical capacity at organizational level fit in operational excellence? Now, that that that's what he wrote. Okay, so. I'm going to interpret this uh, as, as basically asking, you know, uh, if we're talking about analytics, we're talking about something more high power than the basic uh, work that's happening in, in the shop floor. Okay. And, and so if we, if we go back to that Toyota production system, and, and I'm going to switch back to the graphics here now uh, to bring up this one. Okay, let's go back here. So if we start taking a look at this, so so do I need organization high-powered analytics in the in TPS? The answer is no. Do I need them in TQM or TPM. Well, those are actually supporting TPS, and maybe I need some analytics in TPM, and that's an engineering function for predictive maintenance, if you will. And so yes, there is some there, but that's not on the shop floor. That's in a maintenance function. TQM may have some there, and, and if the, the line actually does stop, you know, what happens, that red light comes on. There is a product engineer who comes out to fix the problem. And, and so there is a, a training program for that type of engineer at Toyota, and, and that is an equivalent of more than a black belt, not quite a master black belt, okay? But, but they have 10 weeks of statistical training and problem solving. Uh, over about a five-year period and a lot of practical engineering products. So they understand it. They've been to the suppliers and so forth. So they're a combination production engineer and supplier quality engineer. So, so yeah, there is that function in support of the production operations. Now, where the engineering functions really are buried is in the factory management system. So the factory management system is controlling the conveyor belts. It, it's moving the materials. It's making sure that all of the IT systems are are actually flowing in the right way. And, and it's also then doing the long-term setup of the order flow, making sure the, the electronic pull signals are working. So that's where this, this analytic capability is, is embedded in Toyota. So they have two sorts of positions. One is the production engineering, and there's three levels of engineer there that are actually working. And the other is in this factory management system where they have uh, a combination of IT and engineering functions working together. And, and in Japan, they call all of that industrial engineering. So I okay. think that answers it. I, I think so, okay. Um, so here, here's a question from, from Ricardo. He says, uh, you know, could you do an Andon system in a cement manufacturing process? 
Well, it all depends on which cement manufacturing process you use. <laughs> Okay, so there's, there's, there, I'm going to say there's, there's two fundamental cement manufacturing processes that I know of. Okay, so one is a batch process, which you have like on a, uh, you're putting all the materials, you're mixing it in a truck, and as it's driving down the road, the, the drum is, is shifting and mixing the process. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the value of an Andon system would be for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, maybe if, if you, with the driver, he could do something if you had a light system there that said, you know, do you, you don't need, need a four light system anyhow, but, but you might need something if the water is getting, uh, you know, the cement is getting too hard, there's not enough water in it or something like this. And, and, uh, because if it gets offload, then that rotating drum can get off and you can get a, a truck accident or something that's, so you might have a safety condition. So you, uh, Green, yellow is, is saying that the, there's a water problem. Red is saying you should stop and take care of it. So th that might be something you could put on a truck. Um, but that's like a warning light on a car. Any, basically, it's the same yeah. sort of thing. And then the, the other type of system is the vertical uh, mixing machines that they have. And, and actually, the, those were created, a, a, a friend of mine in Japan has the, the patent on those. And those were made actually from soba noodles. So you put all the machine, the, the mixings in at the top and the, the concrete comes out at the bottom. And, and that the flow through is so fast, uh, I can't think of why you'd want to have an Andon light system. Because if cycle time is so slow and it's so direct, you don't need to have that signaling system. So I, I, I'd say in, in those processes, I'd be very far pressed to, to, to build one in. I, I think you've got to think about what was the purpose of an Andon system in the beginning? Why did they but create it? Yeah, it's signaling yeah. to people that says something is wrong. And, and uh, if the process is so simple, you don't need to signal. And, and it's always like the, uh, the, the reason I said it could work on the truck is if something happening in the back the driver is not aware of and you bring in a signal that says you need to be aware of this. And it's not something that's intuitive. So uh, that might be a need, but but uh, you're you're pushing anything beyond that. Okay. So here here's one just came in um, from Daniel. He says, uh, "Is it possible uh, to do operations excellence without the general manager's engagement? Does the general manager only watch and not be a part of these operational excellence activities?" Um. Mm. Well, it's possible to have operations excellence activities without a general manager engagement. However, um, what I would suspect would happen is it'll fall apart very quickly. Uh, I, I mean, uh, if, if the operations, if the general manager of an operation is not caring about what happens in the daily process of his work, and he doesn't care about that to the extent that he's ignoring the daily management system. I'm going to say that organization's in deep trouble. And, and, and so, um, while well, you can work hard against that, it, it's like trying to. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of what the right analogy is. It, it's like you know, uh, the myth of Sisyphus, where you're pushing a rock always up the hill, only to have it fall down again. Uh, that that you're doing sort of the the impossible type of task. So what I think happens in, in most circumstances is the production manager or general manager of an organization. So if the general manager is like the, the plant manager, uh, there might be a production manager in between. And if they care about it, maybe it can happen. But, but uh, push comes to shove if there's a crisis out there, that general manager may overwhelm the production manager and that will then destroy the system. Because if people start seeing a management intervention that says that's not important, the next thing you know is operation segments won't be important. Okay. Um, so, you know, Ricardo has been giving us some explanation of uh, of his cement manufacturing. Maybe maybe that's something to take offline. I've got a question for you here. Um, so, Ricardo, send me an email. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you an email at the end. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, Patricia asked the question. She says, because you're familiar with Toyota, um, Toyota has experienced recalls, you know, the airbags, 
and uh, other issues. Uh, how does Toyota management handle and investigate problems that cause these huge recalls? What did they learn? How did that fit into this operational excellence framework? Well, uh, the supplier that had the problems are called Takata, and Takata had several problems actually, and, and um, the, there's a, a number of things that happened. So um, I was involved in one of those recalls uh, where the, they typically will have external people uh, from the Toyota workforce. Usually it, it's um, quality people like, well, for one, they had Dr. Kano involved, you know, Dr. Kano, and, and and he led a team of four people to do an investigation because it's a very big deal and it had to do with uh, health and safety of, of drivers. Uh, and, and so they come out with this. There's a report. There's a change to the system. They have the engineering team there to actually make the corrective action. So they're taken very, very seriously when they happen. Uh, but but what, what happens is that sometimes uh, these large companies, will be farming things to their Koretsu, their, their own uh, manufacturing structure. And when it's within the manufacturing structure, it's pretty safe. People understand what needs to be done. They can work very directly. However, if they're buying things on a commercial market, then it's not always that clear. And, and if you take a look at it, most of the Toyota quality problems have come through the supplier quality side. And I think a lot of that's because they can't find all the suppliers who are making parts for the automotive industry, uh, and, and there's kind of a fixed base for that. Uh, like Takata's making those same parts for Ford and General Motors and, and everybody, you know. And, and so it, it's almost like you have this impossible situation. The Japanese call this a red flag situation. So, so it, you know, the red flag is you only do it for us maybe 10% percent of the time and now you're doing it for the rest of the industry so your people are not actually attuned to what our quality requirements are and, and so this is something that then they have to bring to bear you know how do we actually get those suppliers so they do this right and, and Toyota's taken some steps to, to even have those uh, parts dedicated to a particular factory in their purchasing system they have something called one a plan for every part and that means that you follow that part all the way from Mother Earth, if it came out of a river earth materials, you know where it came from, and all the way to processing till it became the part that goes into your car. So they're, they're expecting that full traceability and a full line of uh, understanding those quality characteristics that will affect performance all the way very to the, back to the very beginning. So when they start finding those problems, they're looking for you know, how do we actually fix them along the way. And often people find that if you go to some countries, I won't say which countries, but there are some countries where you get epidemics of it's okay to change the materials if you can make some more money. So if I make a couple of bucks here or a couple of bucks there, I put it in my pocket. I don't share it. But I, I, I got you know through that because I gave a little slightly worse material or something like this. And, and all of a sudden you start seeing those things sneaking in because those companies do not actually share the same sort of guidelines and principles that are within the Toyota system. And that's why the Toyota Corporation likes to work with their own suppliers rather than external ones. Okay, that kind of brings up another question that I think is highlighted by this, this, uh, uh, this global virus that we're facing. One of the things the virus has done is it's exposed weaknesses in our supply chain. Uh, things that we assumed were going to be fine and suddenly you no longer have something because a factory over here shut down or, or you, you didn't multi-source that. And, uh, or perhaps a shift in demand has created a different need for supply chain capacity. So how does operational excellence address these kinds of broad supply chain issues? Ooh, that's a $64,000 question right there. Uh, we have to reinvent our supply chains. You know, we, we nobody anticipated the coronavirus or the impact it would have or how it's going to affect movement of goods between countries and so forth. You know, uh, this is one of the problems we have as, as human beings. We tend to think that tomorrow will be just like yesterday, you know, and so we have this linear view of the world. Well, that's actually what, what uh, I call profane knowledge. You know, we have to be prepared for the risks of tomorrow, but uh, sometimes we cannot actually anticipate them. So, so Toyota does not have single vendor. Uh, 
uh, and and so forth. And and uh, I mean, many of the organizations in the world, when the tsunami hit Japan in in 2011, you know, that almost killed all of the the raw material going into lithium batteries for the whole world. Uh, it, was, it was just a couple of miles short of destroying that factory. And if that factory had been destroyed, we would have no electric batteries in, in our laptops, you know, uh, for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And so all all of them, they, they started saying, we have to have a different factory someplace. What do we do about that? You know, so so people who have not actually tracked their supply chain back to Mother Earth got some very big surprises. And, and so we started becoming more aware, but that was just, you know, nine years, nine years ago. Well, eight years or something like that. And, and so part of the problem is our supply chain thinking hasn't actually comprehended that. So I think that, that we have major vulnerabilities in, in all production operations because we really have to think that through. And, and the only way I, I believe that you can actually do that is to literally do what Toyota does and, and understand the flow of every part from the time that, that you, the two flows you have to worry about. One is the, the information flow to the supplier and say, do you actually get the drawings right or, or the, the requirements right? That's one thing. And then the second is the material flow from the time that the very raw material comes out and goes through their processes to make components and then comes in. And, and that includes not only the parts, but also the packaging and everything else that goes with it. And so um, I would say most companies have no idea what that is. I work with some very large companies right now, and one of them has well, they're an $80 billion company, and, and, and they have no real control over their specifications. They get what's called a performance specification now. And I've been on them for years about that. And they even give it in two-dimensional CAD instead of three-dimensional CAD. And I've been on them for years about that. Now they're starting to realize, hey, we're actually making some major mistakes in this. And so there's some big wake-up calls that companies just have been ignoring for time, and now they can no longer ignore them. Thank you. Um, okay, then. Well, so we're going we're gonna to stop our recording now.